Well, thank you very much, Sasha, uh, for inviting me. It's an absolute pleasure. And thank you to Ross too for taking on the burden of responding. This is a very early uh, developed paper. So it's a great thing to be able to present this now when it's still not fully formed uh, to get some critical feedback to help me along in refining it. So let's get started. You've all heard of the climate emergency movement and I'm sure you've all heard of climate emergency claims and the use of the wartime analogy to ramp up mobilization and action um, to prevent dangerous climate change. We know that the Paris Agreement is not delivering what we need in the time that we need. And so it's kind of understandable to see a movement emerge at this point to uh, invoke the emergency frame to try and ramp up collective action. The movement actually is now global in reach or it's mostly concentrated in the West, but particularly in the United Kingdom and Australia. So it's a global movement, but it's got local iterations and they're not all quite the same. There are different actors and this makes it difficult and a bit dangerous to overgeneralize. But I'll probably do a little bit of that because we don't have time to go down into the weeds and look at each iteration of every movement. So just a very quick timeline. The very first book in Australia on this was called Climate, Ro Climate Code Red, The Case for Emergency Action, which came as early as 2008. And the authors of that went on to develop um, a radical think tank in Melbourne um, called uh, Safe it's Climate Restoration. And the first climate emergency declaration in the world happened in Melbourne um, in 2016 in the city municip municipality of Darabin. So it's got quite a big activist network in Melbourne and elsewhere in Australia. But we've also seen um, the uh, lots of different publications by activist academics and authors like Bill McKibben's um, A War at, at uh, he uses the war analogy in his piece in the New Republic in 2016. There's the cl climate mobilization movement in the US led by Klein Salomon and um, Ezra Silk. There's all sorts of manifestations, but the most common is Extinction Rebellion, which emerged in 2018 and took up nonviolent direct action in London. And of course there's Greta. We all know about Greta who started her lone school strike, not knowing she'd be ending up um, seeding a global school strike movement. There have been lots of emergency declarations um, issued. We can talk perhaps in discussion about whether they've actually worked to galvanize action, but I'm focusing more on the claims of the movement here. <clears throat> so let's dive in. What I want to do is <clears throat> examine the democratic ethics of this movement. And I'm gonna do it by first looking at the, I've rounded up all the critiques of the movement uh, and I'm going to sort of sort and sift those arguments and present them. <clears throat> and then I'm going to, so the idea is to ask, is this movement an uncritical or naive purveyor of emergency politics, or is it a democratic, creative innovator that is seeking to adapt and ultimately protect democracy in a, in a climate change world? So I'm doing this with a sympathetic eye, uh, a kind of ethnographic sensibility, because my aim here is, is to do a different type of political theory. I'm not gonna write down what I think ought to happen. I'm writing down what I understand to be the self-understanding of the movement activists. So that might make this a little lopsided in the sense that I'm speaking for them in a sense, but trying to also extract their ethics from what they say. So uh, what do I mean by democratic ethics? Well, there's no single ethical principle underlying or informing democracy. We all accept the idea that it includes one person, one vote, and that's what distinguishes it from autocracy. And underpinning that is, the, is a kind of egalitarianism that every person in the world matters and they matter equally and should therefore have an equal say. And that's kind of a stock in trade idea that will travel across different types of democracy. But all democracies come with a prefix or an adjective which explains what sort of democracy we're looking at. So we've heard of direct democracy versus representative democracy or deliberative democracy versus electoral democracy or liberal democracy versus social democracy. So by the end of this, hopefully we can think of a suitable prefix. If you believe there is a democratic ethics in this movement, a suitable prefix that might attach to the style of democracy practiced by the climate emergency movement. 
the grassroots um, practitioners rather than the governments that have actually issued the declarations. So under, underpinning any understanding of democracy is also um, a set of norms relating to recognition, how one does representation, what sort of participation matters and how we make decisions. But at a more fundamental level, there are some very basic coordinates that we can recognize. Basic coordinates of, coordinates of time, space, agency and community. So uh, this could be a local soccer club or it could be a nation state or it could be a global democratic movement that's trying to stretch the time horizons of decision makers to include new forms of agency, uh, wider understandings of community. And of course, with this comes different types of knowledge that are privileged. So these are the really fundamental things that we, I think about when I think about the democratic ethics. So it's not just an ethics, it's an ontology, it's an epistemology. Um, it's, it's a cosmology, if you will. Cos who's in the cosmos and who's not? That kind of question, not just the demos. So, um, I'm going to discern this from their claim making and from some of their proposals. And I'll do this to some extent when I look at the critics of the movement. So um, I do this by developing um, three ideal types of emergency, which I'll use as heuristics to sift and sort the claims of the critics and, and the movement itself. So let's dive into these criticisms. What I've found is there's not a lot, but there's a sizable body of work and it is growing. Curiously, most of it comes from political theorists. There are a few bloggists and commentators, but some of them have a background as academics. And so they're quite refined critiques. They generally draw on political theory, work on political theology or state of exception or emergency powers or critical security studies of securitization. And science and technology studies, which examine the role of experts in democracy. So they're the broad fields that these criticisms come from. And I've pulled out four line, main lines of argument. The first is the most predictable, that invoking emergency mode is, a, is invoking a state of exception and emergency powers, and that that's an anti-democratic move. It's anti-democratic because it, se it seeks to move beyond normal politics to emergency politics, override disagreement and um, suspend where necessary civil, political and economic rights as we've seen during wartime government. So for Murphy, this is a fraught tool because it reifies sovereignty, not freedom. It enables governments to seize and reassign public and private assets against the ex existential threat of climate change. So it's like pushing the world into a generalized state of, of emergency. And it reaffirms the power of political deceit, the political um, elites to make decisions and um, put the sovereign above the people. So all of this is riffing on, I guess, Carl Schmitt's rejection of liberal democracy because it le leads to endless debate and compromise. So um, instigating a state of emergency restores the right of the sovereign to breach normal law and decide what shall be. This is decisionism. And a lot of these criticisms draw on Agamben's um, State of Exception, his book, State of Exception, which was written in the aftermath of um, the second Bush administration's war on terror. The second line of argument is the critique of um, invoking the, 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 the apocalypse, this apocalyptic rhetoric of fear, which is trying to use moral coercion to extract obedience that this politics of fear is a basis for ushering in eco-authoritarianism in a new guise. And we saw this with a very early wave of limits to growth, the limits to growth movement in the early 1970s, to some extent the late 60s as well with Paul Ehrlich's population bomb. And there's a, a host of publications then that are kind of everyone raises and critiques when they introduce environmental politics in any 101 course. But this also serves to short circuit debate and with the potential to lead to violence. Uh, some have recognized a sort of parallel with Christian, Christian eschatology, this idea of um, imminent and irreversible end of time on the horizon. And it can take a fanatical form and lead to political violence. So they, these are concerns. So they're drawing out the potential of what could happen here. 
The third argument is that it fixates on a singular goal when there should be many. And the key exponent of this is Mike Hume. He says that it just singles out one goal with a simple bunch of metrics based on CO2 concentrations, and we have to do certain things by a certain date, that it's reductive and oversimplifies. It's a singular approach to a complex problem. And it means we stay in a quasi-emergency state until that deadline's reached. This obscures what really matters, which is human well-being. Um, and he's worried that it just focuses the policy gaze on CO2, as if the world will be a better place if there were less concentrations in the atmosphere. As he puts it, with, without such plural goals, without plural goals and political creativity, responding to a climate emergency will only lead to an absolute technocracy. Indeed, it would most logically be implemented through Chinese style command and control governance, more akin to status five year planning than through democratic decision making. And the fourth and final critique is that it, and it follows, these kind of bleed into each other in many ways. I'm just trying to tease out the elements of what is the one, I guess, one composite argument, is that it will uh, privilege um, the view of truth, the truth told by experts. So what does it mean to tell the truth about climate change? This is one of the demands of Extinction Rebellion. How, and here one can easily anticipate the criticism that there isn't a singular truth there are many types of knowledge that are relevant to understanding and responding to climate change. As Davies puts it in a, a broader examination of environmental populism, the claim that a specialist minority is able to represent reality in a non-interpretive fashion that is central to the epistemology of modern fact needs questioning. So, um, and, and can rational science arbitrate all the different political issues here? So they are the four, that's a crystallization of the four critiques. And most of you will probably have been able to anticipate some of those. Um, so before I say, well, does this actually hit the target? Um, clearly all these arguments remind us that emergency politics can go terribly awry. Um, but what I, my key argument is that none of them actually are based on any empirical work on the movement. And this is, I think, highlighting a problem with the way political theory is done when it's talking about general things happening and it responds to it in a general way without actually doing empirical homework. And my argument is that, in fact, most of these arguments don't hit their target. That's not to say there aren't some elements of the movement that could be raising these concerns, so I'm not wanting, wanting to say it's squeaky clean in this sense, but it actually works with only one understanding of emergency. So what I want to do to make my argument is introduce to you three ideal types of emergency and use these as heuristics to demonstrate that the type one emergency, as I call it, the one that the critics have focused on is less evident than what I call type two and type three emergencies. And this will help me make the claim that the climate emergency movement is working with the grain of liberal democracy, that it depends on civil and political rights guaranteed by liberal democracy to wage its campaigns. The campaigns are primarily directed to government, so they expect a liberal democratic government to be doing what they ask or they hope, that insofar as they are trans, there are transgressive practices, it's no more than nonviolent direct action, a well-known civil rights tool. But their claims, the ethics of their claims are the one I want to draw out. And we sh whenever we're talking about emergency politics, I think we need to always have in mind a number of fundamental questions that haven't been asked by the critics. What is the emergency? What is the source and nature of the threat? Who is being threatened and who is resisting? Who are the claim makers? To what extent are perceptions of an emergency widely shared or are they just confected? What are the consequences of failing to act and what is the period of time in which to act? Is it definite, tight, narrow, broad? So with these more general questions in mind, I introduce these three types. So first one, let's call it type one. Oh, the final most important question is, is legitimacy. You can have emergency claims that are accepted by an audience socially or by, by democratic means indirectly through the representatives. They can, we know that democracies have no means of protecting, of presenting, of preventing their self-destruction. 
if movements capture power by democratic means and then start suspending democratic rights. And with this history is littered with examples and the most obvious one is Nazi Germany. But here I'm talking about ongoing uh, social sanctioning or democratic legitimacy of emergency claim making. If that's the case, then we don't have a problem. So type one, I call emergency as a technique of power. This is the Schmittian type of emergency. This is the one that Agamben worried about. And it's the one of most concern to the critics of the climate emergency movement. It does invoke emergency powers to suspend normal democratic politics, legal rules and democratic procedures to maintain or wrest state power, assert total control and override consent. As Carl Schmitt put it, the sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. This is decisionism. But it can happen also by revolutionary movements, the Jacobins, for example. Uh, so revolutionary and popular populist movements. So popular sovereignties, sovereignists, if there's such a word. So this is tantamount to the abandonment of law, respect for social, uh, individual political rights. It's a strategy uh, to transform the state into an authoritarian or totalitarian, totalitarian state with total control over the population. And we saw this with the final solution. So the omnipotent God becomes the omnipotent lawgiver. The exception in jurisprudence is analogous to the miracle in theology. Now here, the emergency is decided by those who seek to maintain, extend, or claim power. It's not as if there, isn't, there may be some basis in it, but it is largely confected. So it's a technique of power. It expects unconditional obedience in return for the promised protection from the threat that has been confected. So that's type one emergency. And we should be very, very, very worried about that type of emergency. Type two is what I call a real emergency acute, right? And the second one is a real emergency chronic. By a real emergency, I mean, it has a material reality. It's a situation where a community encompassing governments and citizens face an actual or imminent threat whereby the failure to respond swiftly and appropriately will lead to serious and or irreversible harm. It's real because it has it is widely recognized and understood as real. It's not confected. A fire, a flood, an armed attack, an imminent attack. You know, any, any sort of massive thing that's coming our way, a meteor, <laughs> for about, you know, anything like that that qualifies. It's not made up. This type of emergency, we can use the acute medical emergency analogy here. It's time critical. So those with the relevant capacity to respond, governments, emergency services, have a social and political duty to act swiftly. This is a responsibility they have to the community. And it may invoke emergency powers and some truncation of property rights or democratic rights. It is temporary, lasts for so long as it's necessary to deal with the threat. The, it is also empowered democratically through legislation passed by the by parliaments and is subject to judicial review. Democratic debate can always occur after the emergency to rake over the coals as it were, to say, you didn't deal with this very well. You are, you, well there was overreach here. Um, there are better ways we can prepare and anticipate and improve our response. So this is an ongoing learning process which happens in between emergencies before and after. But because you need a chain of command, you need to work very quickly it's more or less accepted that it's okay that you may have to encroach on some rights temporarily. So it's based on fear of harm, right? Everyone's mobilized because they don't want to get hurt. They don't want to be damaged. They're trying to hold their community together. It's socially sanctioned and democratically legitimated. In acute emergencies, commun communities accept that firefighters can just enter private property without permission. And even the strongest international human rights instruments contain exception clause to allow for derogations in cases of extreme peril for the survival of the state and its citizens. The third type is the really tricky one. That's real emergency chronic. This type of emergency has all the features of what I just described in terms of the nature of the threat. The only difference is there's no clear endpoint. 
This makes exceptional measures very hard to legitimate. And there's all there's plenty of time for democracy here. It can't, there's no justification for it to be suspended. Um, and to stop the debate over prioritization of public policy, contestation of policy instruments and so forth. Because debate is absolutely critical to social learning about the threat and how to respond. Trial and error, experimentation and so forth. Kicking out governments that aren't doing it well enough. They can invite, invite contestation, including, including among experts because knowledge never stands still. And there are also many forms of knowledge, local experience, particularly when it comes to adaptation, that we ignore at our peril. But here, fear of harm still plays a crucial role, not only in um, driving emergency claim making, because this is, the, this is the nature of the climate emergency, as I understand it. It's a chronic one. And what we have here is not just fear of the acute emergencies increasing and multiplying, but fear of a lost world a lost world, uh, which is based on a future imaginary of, of, the, of the serious consequences of an overheated world. Now, these are the three ideal types. They're not mutually exclusive. Type three, the third one, plays on and builds upon type two, because as I said, a chronic emergency like climate change will be increasingly interspersed with acute ones if timely action is not taken. It's conceivable that a green populist government could seize power and move to type one. We can't rule that out. It wouldn't be very nice to see, but we can't rule it out. But they're ideal types of way of thinking about these three different types. So with them in mind, let's now turn to the criticisms and use the voices of, of the actors to see to what extent, where do they fit and should we be worried? As I've mentioned, most of the critics of climate emergency or the frame, emergency frame, assume type one. They don't even address type two and three, rarely. And it seems, um, it seems very odd. And that's why I think a lot of the criticisms, at this point at least, are conjecture. They miss the mark. They're not actually looking at the emergency claim making. Now, the argument here is, uh, well, Margaret Klein Salomon. Imagine there's a fire in your house. What do you do? What do you think about? Your senses are heightened. You are focused like a laser and you put your entire self into your actions. You enter emergency mode. Um, Greta, I want you to act like you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if your house is on fire because it is. Bill McKibben, World War Three is well and truly underway and we're losing. Jane Morton, who's one of the core climate activists behind the Darabin City Council emergency declaration. So emergency mode is like responding to a flood, which often moves people to acts of great courage and bring communities together to work for the greater good. She goes on to say, in Australia, we're all used to the declaration of emergency in times of natural disaster. In, times, in such times, the priorities of communities shift radically. People readily support rationing or regulation of essential services and are willing to direct all available resources to the shared task of overcoming crisis. Or Paul Gilding, an emergency situator, the former head of Greenpeace International and Australian, um, who's involved with um, the Climate Restoration Project in Melbourne. An emergency is a situation where the normal ways we manage society and the economy cannot adequately deal with the risk we face. It implies, therefore, a change to what we do, commensurate with both the scale and the urgency of the risk. So you can see all of these claims here are invoking primarily emergency two, the acute one, in order to make it work for emergency three, which it's not quite the same thing. So it's um, uh, a chain of equivalence. Uh, Laclauian discourse analysts would call this a, a chain of equivalence between the acute and the chronic that make them the same, treats them as if they're the same, whereas they're actually not. But it's not type one. Although you'll see references to rationing and so forth, but the assumption here is that they would be democratically legitimated. And I'll come to that. If it's not, that's the interesting question. The argument about relying on 
um, apocalyptic rhetoric of fear, you know, petrifying people into obedience. Well, I think undoubtedly that is part of the narrative, part of the frame and the narrative. As Greta Thunberg says at the Davos World Economic Forum in 2019, I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. So I think something akin to millenarianism is clearly evident in these discourses. As Scrimshire puts it, for many millenarians, the essential thing is not an anticipation of a sudden violent conclusion to history, but the end of a certain time within the world. What millenarians unanimously oppose is the legitimacy of the present age. Millenarian, millenarian belief is as much about the turning of a revolutionary cycle and the ushering in of a new political order. And this, of course, makes it a tradition that looks increasingly relevant for the contemporary climate activist movement, which calls for nothing short of a transformation of society. But I don't know why you would call this anti-democratic um, or moral coercion. It seems almost an oxymoron here. It, because that assumes that democratic debate has to be rational and measured and devoid of emotion. Democratic debate is full of passion, anger. In people, enraged people start to engage. People who are fearful say, well, I'm gonna do something about this. Fear of harm clearly is a crucial um, emotion here to mobilize. Um, the acute emergency frame is used for persuasive purposes. It's urging the audience to use their imaginations to think about the future and the consequences of an overheated world. Well, this is gonna be happening more frequently and more often and in ways that are knitted together. So success in persuasion here is not moral coercion. It's, it's the degree to which the claims actually resonate with the audience. And clearly it doesn't resonate with everyone. And you have to match fearful rhetoric with commensurate responses. If they're out of kilter, people won't believe you. Uh, they have to be real uh, and things that people can imagine happening. But if a recent survey by the United Nations Development Program in Oxford at any guide, they did a survey, one of the biggest ever on climate change public opinion um, this year, they surveyed 1.2 million respondents in 50 countries and over 60% were in agreement that there is a climate emergency. So this is not something that a group of activists are confecting, using fear to instill obedience to something that doesn't exist. It's something they're talking about that actually resonates with large numbers of people. Certainly not a majority, there's a lot that resist it. Finally, it fixates on a singular goal with a deadline when there should be many. Well, I think Mike Hume's right. The point of climate action is not to get to a beautiful world where we have a safe climate. That's, reducing emissions is not the end of life, right? the goal of life it is so we can get on and determine what our end should be it's a thing with which we have to deal in order to work on what really matters and i to, to impute that to the movement just seems disingenuous if you ask me when you've got a chronic emergency you have to what the movement's doing and this i guess is my overall argument they're using the acute emergency frame to make it more like an acute one to get the action. There's no clear deadline because we, these things are gonna come down in deeply uncertain and unpredictable ways. So what they're doing, they wanna impose a deadline and the emergency movement deadlines are way sooner than net zero by 2050. They're by 20 to 25 and the goals are one degree, which we've already passed. So they've got more radical goals and much tougher deadlines because because they're trying to get everyone to use their imagination about what's really at stake here. So they're imposing a political deadline to make it, a, an, a, to make, make it more acute and less chronic. So yes, that's confected, you might say. Um, I think that's true. Uh, it might seem arbitrary, and that's true because in such an unpredictable and uncertain complex challenge, anything, anything you say, well, this is where we're gonna settle is arbitrary, two degrees, 1.5, this is a political consensus. It's not drawing on experts here, it's informed by export, experts. Finally, um, the, the, it leads to a technocratic government giving a privileged view of the truth to experts. 
Well, we've heard, tell the truth, listen to the science. This is indeed very simplistic. But it also needs to be put in its political context. Um, it's a response to a failure of governments to take action and take responsibility to climate denialism and post-truth. So what's being asked for here is for governments to be honest about the nature, scale and gravity of the risk and not pretend otherwise. Carrie Norgard's book on climate denialism makes a point that, a point that all of us in a sense act, we, we both are knowing and not knowing, right? We know the scale and gravity of the risk, but to get by in the world, we have to act as if we don't know. To get up each day, do our job, look after our families or our friends and so forth. We have to keep putting it at bay because of the vertigo of responsibility that we hit you if you really thought it through. And we all do this, it's a, coping, a psychological coping mechanism. They're trying to unravel some of those coping mechanisms so we can actually um, use our imagination and let the full force of that fear to hit. Now fear can be numbing and there's lots of research about how fear can be unproductive. And we can talk about that, but I'm just saying this is what the emergency claim making is designed to do. So to wind up, what are the democratic ethics then of the climate emergency movement? What are their coordinates of time, space, agency and community? the norms of recognition, representation, participation, and so forth. What kind of prefix can we put in front of the word democracy to encapsulate their understanding, their ethics? I would call it probably emergency democracy. <laughs> Let's call it that, provisional. Someone in the audience might come up with a better one, but let me, let me go through and examine those coordinates. Quite clearly, their claims are, seek are seeking to extend through time and space um, those who are represented by speaking for younger generations or younger generations who can't vote, speaking for themselves to older generations, to future generations who aren't born, wherever they may live, who can't vote. Some are explicitly seeking to represent non-human species as part of our broader community and their own special forms of agency. So you might also say this is a democracy without borders. So a few quotes, we act on behalf of life. The Extinction Rebellion Declaration of Rebellion says, we declare it our duty to act on behalf of the security and well-being of our children, our communities, and the future of the planet itself. We refuse to bequeath a dying planet to future generations by failing to act now. Vahana Yamin, famous British international lawyer who glued herself to the pavement outside one of the financial centers of London, life, society, and democracy are under threat. So they're protecting democracy too. Jane Morton, but genuine action on climate change would have succeeded long ago if it were not for the vast wealth and power of those opposing action. So this, these are the snippets, there are tons I could have pulled out. I'll be doing a much more systematic discourse analysis of a whole lot of different strands of the movement, um, which I understand as um, a, a kind of, um, doing a kind of incorporated comparison where there's a global movement with different instantiations, all doing it in slightly different ways, but together make up a larger movement. One has to drill down and look at different instantiations and tease it out, but also constantly keep what, what it is that unites them. Another point that seems to be blithely lost in a lot of the criticisms that I've wheeled out is that it's not the state, it's a movement. The idea originated in civil society um, in response to the failure of governments to do what these actors think should, should be done. Folk in the movement see it as their duty to act and to step up when governments fail. So in a sense, there's a kind of, in the Extinction Rebellion handbook called This Is Not a Drill, um, they make it clear. When, a government, when governments and the law fail to provide any assurance of adequate protection and security for its people's well-being and the nation's future, it becomes the right of citizens to seek redress in order to restore dutiful democracy and to secure the solutions needed to avert catastrophe and protect the future. It becomes not only our right, but our sacred duty to rebel, hence the justification for nonviolent um, direct action. So that's about honesty, telling the truth is being truthful to the nature and scale and gravity of the threat. So I'm nearly done now because I've pretty much used up my minutes, just one, one minute to go. So they're invoking familiar strategies of the civil rights movement, but 
you might say it's a bit odd to say, tell the truth, declare a climate emergency, and let's deal with it by deliberative democracy in a citizen's assembly. This is the antithesis of emergency powers. Um, in fact, one of the serious empirical studies of the movement criticized Extinction Rebellion because of its, it was solution agnostic. Like it wanted to say, this is the problem, but now let's get together and talk about it and figure out together how to solve it, solve it. That doesn't seem to me emergency politics. So they're using it in their claim making, but when it comes to dealing with the problem, they're not suspending democracy. They're trying to deepen it and take it out of the state where it's not working and give it to the people. Now we can talk about the effectiveness of the UK Citizens Assembly. The French one uh, was probably the most successful we've seen. This is not saying it was perfect. I'll finish with um, an early piece written by Adam Bant, who is my local member of parliament. He's a member of the Green Party. Uh, uh, he holds a seat, the only Green member in the lower house of our federal parliament. He was a former academic, and in 2009, he wrote a piece defending the emergency claim, arguing that emergency politics by climate activists is not to be feared because we are experiencing emergency te techniques through the strong state of neoliberalism to regenerate and bolster markets and to dismantle this old Keynesian state, which protected workers. So he's a well-known green left writer. So he effectively, in a long, quite complicated piece that goes back through uh, Walter Benjamin's work, Agamben and others, and Schmidt, he says we're almost in a virtual state of emergency, maintaining a structure of sovereignty. Um, so the aim is not to suspend democratic rights, but to invoke them to suspend business as usual with a mass mobilization akin to wartime. So to try and summarize what is a very complicated argument, the neoliberal state is employing type one emergency to prevent a proper response to the real emergency, type two and three would be my interpolation of what's going on there. In March last year, he presented a climate emergency declaration bill to the federal parliament in December. Um, it was dismissed, but the, there were 63 members voting against and 58 members for across party lines. The bill didn't do anything that involved suspending emergency. It simply asked for uh, this climate change to be a priority of all departments. They set up certain authorities, um, but it was a kind of bureaucratic exercise, but it would certainly green government and make it an absolute priority and give a little bit more um, say to scientists into the policy making process, which have zero in Australia. So to finish up, um, my sympathetic reading of the democratic ethics of the movement um, has, has been, well, I've said it, sympathetic. There are criticisms of the movement. It's pretty white and middle class. Some say it doesn't deal with environmental justice enough. There's certainly something in there of the rhetoric, but it's not the pointy end of the movement. It's conceivable that a green government could go awry uh, using these claims as justification. But I'll just leave you with a sobering, sobering question. If democracy is not up to the task now, it will be even less up to the task of managing a world, or will it be better able to deal with this when we're in a world that's in or beyond the zone of 1.5 or two degrees? So I'll, perhaps I'll give the last word to David Spratt and Philip Sutton, who in many ways were the originators of the movement, both of whom live in Melbourne. One way or another, we will get to emergency mode. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Eckersley, uh, for those extremely thought-provoking reflections. I am now going to invite uh, Ross Mitiga, Professor Ross Mitiga, to respond. He will have 10 minutes to respond. Um, and I am delighted to introduce you all uh, to Professor Mitiga. He is an assistant professor at the uh, uh, Institute of Political Science, the Instituto de Ciencias Políticas de la Universidad Católica. Uh, he is also a founder and co-chair of the Western Political Science Association's Environmental Political Theory Virtual Community. He is also an executive council member of the American Political Science Association's Environmental Politics and theory related group. His research draws on a wide variety of perspectives within political theory and across disciplines, 
in order to examine issues in environmental politics and ethics, particularly concerning climate change. He has published in journals such as Philosophical Studies, Social Theory and Practice, and Contemporary Political Theory, among others. And he has just uh, finished writing a book entitled Before Collapse, Climate Change as Political Catastrophe, which is currently under evaluation with Oxford University Press. Thank you very much to Professor Midika um, for your response. With that, I hand you the floor. Hey, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so I first want to thank Robert Eckersley for participating in this series uh, and engaging such an important topic as her work has always done. Uh, uh, Sasha Mudd for organizing this event and for inviting me to provide comments. Uh, the new Institute of Applied Ethics for hosting these, I think, really outstanding talks. Uh, and of course, everyone here for taking uh, time out of their day to discuss climate change, which can, of course, be a, a really kind of bleak topic. Uh, so I appreciate that. Um, so for my comments this afternoon or early evening, I suppose, uh, I'm going to begin with a very, very brief overview of what I understand to be Robin's main argument. A lot of this is going to be kind of uh, redundant to what she said to some extent. Um, and then following that, I will hazard a few questions and comments just to help kickstart the conversation. Uh, so as I understand it, uh, Robin's primary ambition in the paper is to determine whether climate emergency claim making is at bottom a threat to democracy, as many seem to believe and, and certainly have argued, uh, or if instead climate emergency claim making constitutes uh, a valuable means of protecting democracy, deepening it, uh, perhaps in part by taking it beyond its prevailing neoliberal strictures. Um, now, this argument unfolds in three basic steps. Uh, first, Robin identifies uh, uh, a range of standard concerns, complaints with climate emergency claim making. Uh, among these are the worries that invocations of emergency are inherently uh, anti-democratic, technocratic, morally coercive, guided by negative emotions like fear and anxiety and so on. Second, to assess these charges, uh, Robin begins by distinguishing between uh, uh, three types, ideal types of emergency. Uh, the first, which we might call the Schmidian variant, uh, regards em uh, emergency simply as a kind of means for consolidating and asserting great political power, especially with the aim of limiting, limiting dissent or circumventing ordinary legal and constitutional barriers. The second type, which we might call a punctuated emergency, or uh, in, in Robin's words, an acute emergency, uh, is quote unquote, a situation uh, in which a community encompassing governments and citizens faces an actual or imminent threat whereby the failure to respond swiftly and appropriately will lead to serious and or irreversible harm. As a little kind of asterisk here, I, I think it might be interesting to kind of unpack uh, the actual or imminent part of this, uh, which the paper does not do, but I think there is a tension there. Uh, it might raise a kind of a series of in interesting questions. Now, uh, this type of emergency, we, we might think of natural disasters, uh, health crises like, like pandemics, the coronavirus pandemic, or perhaps extreme economic depressions. Uh, and in these cases, uh, in the cases of type two emergencies, uh, democratic rights might be truncated, Robin explains, uh, but, with the broad, but within the broader aegis of parliamentary and judicial oversight and control. So in some sense, it's still democratically legitimated deviations from democracy. Um, finally, we have type three emergencies, uh, uh, which uh, uh, Robin calls chronic emergencies, we might call them sustained emergencies, which largely mirror punctuated emergencies, apart from having no determinate endpoint in sight. Uh, rather, these are long unfolding disasters, which require substantive, perhaps even unpre unprecedented uh, political action. Yet, uh, Robin's careful to argue, given their long time horizons, uh, these chronic or sustained emergencies leave ample space for democratic deliberation and contestation, and so are less prone to legitimating extreme political measures. Now, with this framework in place, uh, Robin proceeds to the third and final part of the argument, uh, which involves responding to the four common criticisms I mentioned earlier. Uh, now, both for the sake of uh, time and to avoid uh, redundancy, and also because I think this part of the paper is the least developed right now, I won't reproduce those responses. Uh, suffice it to say that, that Robin clearly believes that the standard criticisms can be overcome, 
uh, particularly uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, if we understand climate change as a type three emergency that gives rise to type two emergencies, but which need not become a type one emergency with all of its anti-democratic baggage. And furthermore, we have very good reason to regard the climate emergency in precisely this way, at least if we maintain an empirically honed ethnographic sensibility, uh, 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 we'll see that these, you know, the movements pushing climate emergency claims tend to be strongly committed to liberal democratic norms. In fact, if we look closely at the diverse array of climate emergency movements, uh, as, as, as Robin's paper admirably does, we might well conclude that they're even more committed to democracy than the governments that they're protesting. Uh, for these movements are uh, often are calling for new forms of inclusion, deliberation, and participation, the sum of which may constitute a radical new vision of democracy, one that transgresses the normal boundaries between generations, species, and states. Uh, and for these reasons, uh, Robin concludes, the aim of climate emergency making quote unquote, is not to suspend democratic rights, but rather to invoke them to suspend business as usual with a mass mobilization akin to wartime. Very, very powerful. So uh, that's my summary. Uh, I'd now like to raise a few questions, uh, but first one I first want to stress here, uh, uh, as, as uh, Robin just briefly mentioned, the, the manuscript is still at a very early stage of development. And, and this means that my offering comments here carries with it a little bit of danger. Uh, you know, for as uh, Marianne Evans or George Eliot, uh, the, the, the author of Middlemarch, once observed in that book, if you expose a sprout to light too soon, you risk killing it. Um, so my hope then, Robin, is that you'll not take my comments here as criticisms, but rather just as friendly suggestions for, for how you might continue uh, tending to this very promising shoot in your already quite verdant scholarly garden. Um, so disclaimers out of the way, now for some fun. Uh, uh, my first question concerns these type one emergencies, which are again, emergencies as techniques of power. Now I worry that distinguishing this type from the other two doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, uh, in other words, I wonder, could something be a type one emergency without at least purporting to be a type two or type three emergency at the same time? Uh, you know, consider the context in which Schmidt was writing. I think this helps make it clear, uh, which is say in the late Weimar Republic, right as the Nazis were uh, ascending to power. Now, as the historian Timothy Snyder has compellingly argued in, in that book, Black Earth, uh, the Nazis believed Germany to be in the grips of what, what we might call a genuine type three emergency in the sense that they believed the country would soon not, not have enough arable land to feed its citizens. And this fear of material scarcity fed the imperialist demand for Lebensraum, uh, room to live. Uh, now, add to this a type two emergency like the Reichstag fire, and we have a clear path to authoritarian politics, which is to say a clear path to a type one emergency. Uh, but could we have reached that point without the ecological panic uh, that sustained the idea of Lebensraum or the Reichstag fire, which helped to justify putting an end to debate and dissent? Uh, that, that's not at all clear to me. If I'm right, there can be no type one emergencies that are not also at least purportedly type two or three emergencies, then it seems like the tripartite scheme collapses in a certain sense. Now, this is not to say that the idea behind type one uh, emergencies is unclear or unhelpful, quite the opposite. I do believe, however, that it constitutes only one half of a full conceptual picture. Let me explain. Uh, uh, communities can respond to emergencies in any number of ways. And some of these are going to be compatible with democracy and liberal rights, and others are gonna be completely inimical to democracy and liberal rights. Uh, importantly, though, it seems to me that all responses from the most democratic to the most Schmidtian are at bottom uh, ways of treating emergencies as techniques of power. Uh, of course, this is not to minimize the important differences uh, between them, between democratic and, say, Schmidtian responses, uh, but simply to suggest that many responses to emergencies may result in radical departures from political norms and in the emergence of new and consolidated forms of political power. 
Now, this could be scary, as when governments use emergencies to quash dissent and consolidate control. Or it could be more felicitous, uh, as when popular movements utilize emergency frameworks to disrupt the kind of dilatory status quo politics uh, that have delivered us to this unhappy precipice. Now, I think Robin might already be kind of open to this idea, open to this way of uh, viewing uh, 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 emergencies as techniques of power, this kind of more expansive view, given how she describes some of the more radical currents in the climate emergency movement as a kind of inverted type one emergency. It turns the type one emergency on its head. Uh, but, but I'd invite her to say more, develop this idea out a little more. Okay, next question. Uh, this one concerning the idea of a, of a chronic or sustained emergency. And this question is very simple. How can we distinguish this type of emergency from simply a bad normal? Uh, after all, if politics can proceed in these situations, more or less in kind of normal form with democratic debate fully intact, what makes that situation an emergency? What makes it exceptional? Now, to get clear on this, it might be necessary to say more about what counts as an emergency in a general sense, uh, which the paper does not do right now. Now, uh, this brings me to the next question, uh, which is, I think, my penultimate question. Um, what advantages are there for adopting a categorization scheme that distinguishes emergencies seemingly exclusively in relation to their time horizons, as the paper seems to do, rather than, say, in relation to their severity, uh, like we categorize hurricanes, uh, or something more complex, like severity relative to governmental capacity. Uh, the, the choice of using time horizon as the kind of relevant criterion is not defended in the paper, uh, and it's not clear to me that it could be sustained. Uh, my sense is that the attraction to that distinction, that way of parsing uh, type two from type three emergencies, it, is that it seems more capable of accommodating the rather peculiar features of the climate crisis. Uh, in particular, uh, that the most catastrophic effects of climate change won't be felt for years to come, even though they're being caused and locked in relatively silently right now. But I think there are other perhaps more compelling ways of capturing that inconvenient truth. Uh, uh, for instance, we could distinguish between climate change as an emergency of effects and uh, uh, from climate change as an emergency of action. Uh, climate change is an emergency of effects in that it is giving rise to a range of natural and social disasters. And these are only likely to increase in magnitude and frequency going forward. Uh, but it's also an emergency of action in that we have precious little time to prevent full out catastrophe and collapse, which is to say to cur curtail those of our present actions that will make such terrible effects inevitable. Now, it seems to me that this more comfortably captures the distinctive features of the climate emergency than the time horizon distinction in the paper. And so I'd invite uh, Robin to say a little bit more about that. So now for my final question, I, I, I know I've probably already exceeded the time a bit. Uh, uh, what if climate emergency politics cannot be made democratic in form? I think this is a, the kind of key question the paper ends with. In other words, what if the only ways of effectively responding to the climate, climate crisis at this late stage or in the near future involves, requires adopting a more technocratic, top-down authoritarian politics one that permits little dissent, transgresses rights, for instance, of property, limits individual autonomy, and all those other bad things. Does it follow from this that the climate emergency movement or the idea of climate emergency is inherently anti-democratic? Now, the main argumentative strategy of the paper seems to center on showing that climate emergency politics are not necessarily a threat to democracy in the sense of requiring anti-democratic policies. Quite the opposite, the climate emergency movement may even help advance deep in democracy. And that, that may well be true. But I think this tact concedes too much to critics insofar as it conflates, as they tend to do, emergency politics that adopt anti-democratic means with those that adopt anti-democratic ends. It seems to me that a movement can be anti-democratic in the former sense, it can it, it espouse anti-democratic policies without being anti-democratic in the latter sense. Now, this idea is a bit complex, but what I have in mind here is something like Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. Uh, Popper famously argued that a tolerant society can and should be intolerant of intolerance 
Because if a tolerant society tolerates intolerance for long, it may well bring about its own destruction. Uh, it seems to me that an analogous point could be made about climate emergency politics, which may involve adopting anti-democratic measures precisely for the sake of preserving democracy in the long term. Uh, in this sense, even if the climate emergency were to espouse anti-democratic policies, uh, I don't think this would mean that it, that it is for that reason anti-democratic in essence, at least so long as such actions were explicitly motivated by desire to restore democracy once the crisis had been concluded. Now, I have many, many more questions and comments besides these. It was a real pleasure to read the paper, um, but as I'm already, I think, deeply past time, I think I'll leave it here. Uh, but, but thank you again, Robin, for this uh, excellent paper. I really look forward to seeing the idea develop further and the conversation that's about to follow. Many thanks, many thanks to you, Ross. Um, Robin, I would like to give you the floor and give you an opportunity to respond, first of all, before we open it up to, to broader discussion. Thank you, Ross. They were fabulous comments. And there's no doubt that whatever iteration of this comes out, you are going to be one of the people credited uh, for helping me develop it. So thank you. Um, I love your analogy about exposing a sprout to the sunlight too soon. Um, this was put together in a rush, although it's been mulling around in the back of my mind for a long time. The first point, I think, is an excellent one. They are actually all techniques of power in one view. I guess probably the best way to response, respond to that is to what extent are they legitimated, are legitimated techniques of power. I mean, you say law is a technique of power, uh, policy, you know, so the state is a technique of power. It's a whole bunch of techniques of power in that sense. So um, your point about, there being a real basis to the threat to the Nazi regime you know, in terms of resource scarcity is a really good one. But they obviously, what they did with that threat and built it up and helped to confect it by the Reichstag Five, Reichstag Five, for example, turned it into something ultimately that was more confected than real. And, and that's only because they had, you know, grandiose ambitions too. So um, it's hard for a any regime to confect an emergency with no ba absolutely zero basis in reality. We want to think about the way our government, uh, it, our border policies to refugees, which are absolutely shocking. They even tried to amend the Immigration Act so that certain islands around Australia, which are in our territorial zone, are not Australia for the purposes of the Immigration Act. So let's talk about confecting, um, changing law, using law as a technique of power to stop the boats and pretending to be caring about drowning when they're really playing to the racist underbelly of Australian society. So there's always a basis there because this unregulated, irregular immigration, we know fans concerns. And so we've seen states play with that. So there's always a basis to emergency politics or um, and you bring the military in or securitization or what have you. So yes, I, that actually did, I had this little inkling at the back of my head, back of my head that I was, the distinction between type two and three was a little bit too self-serving of the movement than perhaps it should be for a more, uh, for, for a typology. So I guess what really distinguishes the three and the question of time I'll come to is the extent to which it is developed and legitimated either through ordinary democratic processes and or resonates really strongly with the community. And so there's a shared understanding, a shared sense of threat that provides the, the democratic warrant or the social license as it were. And so that's the thing I think that distinguishes type one from type two or three. But that's a great question. I think that will help me tighten up the way I organize and defend those typologies. So thank you. And I kept thinking of Chantal Mouffe, you know, and agonism, you know, there's a kind of, the friend enemy distinction here as well, but maybe I'll play around with that. Um, you say that why use the time horizon as the crucial distinction between types two and three? Um, well, it's because I was holding constant things that are also obviously highly relevant, like the severity of the threat. Um, I just said that the difference, so 
they both involve equally severe threats as so many things similar to them. But what's different about the third one is that it's lengthened. And in a sense, there is a, an element of confection here on the part of the climate emergency movement. In calling climate change in general an emergency, they're treating it as if it were acute, whereas it's only the actual impacts and effects that are acute and they bubble up from time to time. And sometimes you can have a whole lot of them and they go away for a while. But it's the fact that they're going to accumulate is and that's the kind of generalized emergency, but that doesn't have a deadline. So they impose it. So in a sense, type three emergency is something that the climate, climate emergency claims are claiming. Now, whether that's a confection or something, they just, they're using the acute to create an emergency around the chronic condition that we're in. So in a sense, um, there's two ways I could do this. Uh, what I say about a discourse analysis will be different from what I might do with a Weberian set of ideal types. And this is just my first cut into the territory. And I may be doing it differently rather than using those three heuristics. I'll obviously be talking about these differences in different ways. How I organize that is not fully formed in my thinking. This was my first cut. I'm obviously going to do a serious Cook's tour through the Cook's tour is a phrase that Australians use because Captain Cook was stopping all stations in the Southern Hemisphere. So we always use that, you know, like a, a tour of duty, as it were. Um, of course, that's all very repugnant to Indigenous Australians too. But nonetheless, um, I'll be doing a careful reading of all the political theology and all of that. So I have an absolute grasp, but, you know, a much deeper, I want to write about that in a much deeper way. So this is not going to be one paper. But it may be that this is something I'll simply draw out in the discourse analysis. And, you know, in being faithful to the claims of the movement, I'll be able to then sort them through my coding and my analysis of the coding. So maybe that would be the best way of dealing with that. The way they play with the time dimension, stretch it, stretch it over, a, they convert a, a chronic condition into that. And here I've been grappling with the difference between emergency and crisis because I've done theoretical work on crisis before, crises of legitimacy. And uh, I did that with the collective. I love working with collectives and I'll probably be bringing people into this team. Um, we have a research grant um, submitted, who knows whether we get it, but I'll work on it anyway. A crisis we conceived of as a critical turning point. And we, again, we use the medical analogy uh, that it, for a government, if they don't respond in a timely and appropriate way, they will be disempowered. So we, legitimacy, legitimacy is a, a slippery thing, but we all, we all recognize its absence when there's a crisis in the sense that a regime that doesn't respond sufficiently and enough time will lose power. So there's a kind of disempowerment that follows a crisis if you don't respond uh, appropriately. You'll be kicked out of office or you might be overthrown. So um, there are, Cogn they're cognate terms and I haven't fully sorted out the difference between those two, but time, you know, the chronic acute came from that thinking, I guess. Um, what if climate emergency politics cannot be made democratic? So look, I've played with this idea for a while. In fact, um, the idea that you might have to suspend democracy to protect it. Um, the idea of the paradox of tolerance. Um, and I do find that in some of the discussions that you read, you know, that this, the, the, the climate restoration project, there's a lot of scientists in that and there are some elements of naivety there, uh, but some of the voices you find do see this not just about restoring the climate, but also about restoring democracy. But of course, that, that would all make us nervous in terms of, you know, how we think about ends and means here. What do you need to do along the way to save the climate in order to save democracy? Because democracy is not going to survive the Hobbesian world of a, a red hot world. Um, th that for me is getting into dangerous territory. <laughs> um, it's where I get off the bus, as it were. I've been on the bus, you know, trundling along, say, ring the bell, I'm, I'm going to get off at this point. I do worry about that because um, in the more general work I've done on democracies, democracy is essential for wicked complex challenges like this because we've got a zillion problems to solve in transformatory ways 
And that can only that cannot be done alone. It can only be done collectively. We need to learn from our mistakes. So it's it's correcting, and it's it's the best system we have for social learning. And how can we learn our way into managing a mammoth crisis by suspending that capacity? For me, that's unthinkable. But that's me. There may be members of the movement that think they can make a democratic argument for suspending democracy. And I'd like to explore that actually. I mean, from a political theory point of view, you know, to look at work on that, to see if there's work on that and to try and work out what I think about it. My, my instinct is that I wouldn't like it, <laughs> but maybe I could be persuaded if it was done well. Um, so that's, look, there's a lot more I can say. And if you've got more comments, please feed them to me afterwards because I'd love to hear them. It's really going to help me develop what is a very early iteration of a study. Thank you, Ross. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Um, y ahora me gustaría abrir la, la conversación y, y invitarlos, eh, invitarles perdón, a, a formular sus preguntas o a través de la función de mano. Eh, igual pueden escribir las preguntas, sus preguntas eh, en el chat o en inglés o en español. Yo estoy muy contenta de, de traducir. Um, okay, uh, here I see, uh, first uh, I will give the word to uh, Thomas Schwacki. Adelante, gracias. Thank you, Sasha. My name is Tomas, not 587382. I, I'm too stupid to fix that. That's why I have a number instead of my name. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I, I wanted to stay on this sort of scary topic we're talking about here at the end uh, about uh, you know suspending democracy in name of defending democracy. And I wonder if actually the, the, the Schmidt that wouldn't be more interesting to look at is the earlier one of his work on dictatorship and the distinction he makes between commissarial dictatorship and sovereign dictatorship. Uh, Schmidt actually prefers the, the notion of sovereign dictatorship, uh, whose purpose is to, to actually transform a, a regime uh, fundamentally, rather than suspend uh, law for a, a small period of time and take care of emergency in name of that same legal uh, system. Uh, what what makes this 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 topic I think particularly scary? I, I don't usually like to invoke Schmidt in, in any context at all, but here it, it it seems that he has to be dealt with. Is that if we're talking about a chronic crisis, uh, perhaps you know what what would logically tend to happen is a, a notion of a rather more sovereign dictatorship, and 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 actually Ross himself I think used the terms some sort of radical new form of democracy, which is a radical transformation, regime transformation, I, as I understand it. But as, as hopeful as that may sound, it still is extremely scary, you know, because it, it leads you into a, a really very uh, uncertain uh, territory. So the combination of the idea of a chronic crisis and the notion that you might need to, you know, <laughs> tinker with the workings of democracy might lead you to this notion of a sovereign dictatorship in the Schmittian sense, which I think, as I say, is, is really, really scary. Particularly if, if, if we're thinking not only of a chronic crisis, but of a, a crisis that perhaps involves some sort of um, massive uh, interventions in, in terms of of collective action. Uh, and you know, when you have collective action problems, you have a, a uh, temptation to introduce coercion to solve those collective action problems, you know, and, and, and here we're talking about collective action problems at a, at a global uh, level. So you might even come to think of some sort of global intervention as in, in, into nation states and their compliance with certain forms of, 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 of protection of, of, the, of the environment and so forth and so on. So anyhow, going down that road, I think it's just really, really dark and scary. And I wanted to hear what you had to say about that a little. Thank you. Well, well I'm basically in agreement. Um, I was doing my darndest in those typologies to defend uh, a role for emergency powers that were democratically legitimated with our existing institutions. So clearly I'm, I'm very sympathetic to your concerns. Um, however, if I, I did briefly mention the paper by Adam Bant and one reading of that could mean that he's, this idea of a populist, a climate populist movement that was speaking in 
you know, claiming popular sovereignty. Uh, this could be a basis for wresting control. It could be a basis of a revolutionary, a Jacobin style um, reign of terror. Um, so thinking of the French revolution analogy there, um, the fact that a movement itself is not structured democratically, it's actually Extinction Rebellion in this case, because a lot of these movements come and go and they're, they're not seen at the moment because of the pandemic. Uh, so it's kind of been quelled because it was very much a visible movement. What we're seeing now is it's just more the pressure for different organisations and governments to declare a climate emergency. In many ways, it's been kind of domesticated. Its fangs have been taken out. Its anti-democratic fangs have been removed and it's now code for most people saying, yeah, I really, I really care about the climate problem and I wish governments would do more. Yeah, climate emergency. That's kind of where it's come to. Uh, which is not in itself a bad thing, but it's not it doesn't have the potency that you would that the movement would have wanted. Um, so, um, Thomas, I, I, it's something I'm going to look at, and I guess uh, what we're proposing in our research project is to do some workshops in London and in Melbourne, which are really the set of places for the movement. Um, so, good places for comparison where they've been around a long time where we're gonna draw out their climate democratic imaginaries. So maybe my answer to the question is simply, yeah, I'm with you, I'm scared about this, but let's hear from the movement folks. So we're gonna give them some scenarios, um, IPCC scenarios, including ones that they want. And we're asking them to backcast and imagine how we would get from here to there. And the design is to work out their imaginaries of government and democracy, not just climate and the role of movements people. And we think with those different scenarios and we'll have in those workshops, we'll have not only people from the movement, but scientists, um, politicians and others. And we're gonna have uh, one, a whole day one, and then a follow-up one where we feed back the scenario to them and they can say, is this faithful to what they say? And we'll adjust it and write it up. And I think those socio-technical imaginary, so what role of science and technology, what role of experts, how does this happen? Does the movement persuade existing politicians? Is there something more revolutionary happening? And I think when we give them a range of options here with um, you know, impending catastrophe in some where these acute emergencies are just multiplying, I think that will draw it out of the movement uh, because that's what I'm ultimately trying to study here rather. And we have to, that's the only way we can research the future is through backcasting scenarios and using our, our imagination to see where that would go. And I think the fact that we have so many harsh lessons, warnings from history here, that they do have a sobering effect. And whether that comes into the discussion is something I'm gonna be very interested in, in seeing. So it's not a full answer to your question. I'm gonna certainly be reading more of Schmidt's early work, thanks to your question. But that's probably the way I will approach that in this project. Excellent, thank you. Um... Alfonso Donoso. Thank you, Sasha. And thank you very much for sharing this, uh, Professor Eckersley. And I'm really sympathetic to the project. And I look forward to, to reading the paper, the final version of the paper. Um, my first question, um, after uh, hearing what Ross had to say, I think it's a bit of a follow up to that. But um, I, I would like to put some pressure on these uh, ideal types of emergency. And I was wondering, or it was unclear to me whether type one was really uh, a type of emergency rather than uh, a way to manage or to tackle emergencies. Because it seems clear to me that the second and the third are describing uh, forms of emergency with I, I understand and I, and, I, and I agree with Rose that maybe you can make different distinctions, but it's clear the distinction between one and two, uh, two and three. But to me, it seems that uh, type one is rather focusing on something very different, which is how you manage or administer emergencies. And that's why you can have type two and type two and um, type three mix with type one or democratic or anti democratic ones. So I would, uh, without having read the paper, I think that's a kind of my a reaction to that, those uh, ideal types. It seems to me that the first one is really addressing an important point, but it's different from describing emergencies, emergencies, which is what type two and three are doing. 
And the second one is just beyond the paper, but you briefly mentioned um, democracy without borders. And I, I was wondering whether you have something else to say or what, what are your, is your opinion about uh, including the non-human within democracy? Um, because I haven't, yeah, I, I'm just curious about your, your thoughts about uh, non-human representation, representation of what part of non-human nature and so on. So if, if you could say something about that. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I think the reason I chose to call type one an emergency is simply A, that was the primary focus of the critics of the movement. And I was just confused as to why they didn't actually address any parts of the, the real emergency that the movement was thinking about, right? So it was kind of confected versus real. And so I put it in there because it was a means of me showing, yes, this type of emergency, if you call it that, is, is how you manage an emergency or one way. But because it's such a big focus of study and critical, you know, the securitization move, uh, that's all about claim making acceptance, but it also comes from, always comes from the state. And I thought, aren't the critics focusing on the fact that this is not the state making these claims, it's a movement. They seem to miss something important. So, um, it was my way into the to the to the material. Of course, the claim makers are expecting the state to then treat it like an emergency, and that's when type one can kick in. So I have to think about more about the logic of that. Um, if I call them ideal types, that so they need to be working on a similar plane, and they're not. So I recognise that problem. I'm just explaining why I did that because I wanted to identify the Schmittian emergency and show that. That's the full focus of the critique, but it's missing. It's really not listening to what the claims are and what they're talking about, as if that doesn't exist. Um, and sometimes critics can. They, I always like to hear, well, what do they think about the real emergency? Why don't they write about that too? But they don't. They're just kind of being contrarian in that sense, which is not to say that we have to keep that type one firmly in mind. Um, I will then, yeah. I, your comments and Ross's will make me think about how I deploy that or whether indeed I do. It's just a first cut of the problem in response to critics. The second question um, I'm happy to answer because it's something I've thought about for a while. Um, I mean, if you accept the critique of anthropocentrism or if you accept the critique that um, the people's representatives should be thinking more broadly than simply their electorate or short-term self-interest, then if you think of the, the norms of democratic recognition and, and uh, representation, they're really not fit for purpose for the ecological crisis writ large. And this is where your fundamental ethical precepts uh, determine what sort of democracy you think is appropriate. So in earlier publications, I've developed an account of ecological democracy, uh, which I, replace what is the all subjective principle. That is all those, not replace, I supplement it. The all subjective principle is all those subjected to the rule should have some say or otherwise be represented in the making of rules, right? I say, well, what about the all affected principle? That is all those affected by decisions, wherever they live now, or, or those yet to be born that will seriously be affected. Um, they should be have some form of representation too. So, so you're extending the norms of representation through space and time based on the all affected principle. So it's not replacing what we have, but supplementing it. So everyone lifts their gaze a little bit more and looks beyond a little bit more to think through the consequences of their decision. Because if those consequences were visited directly on them, they would not make the decision. They're passing them through space and time. So that was what I called an ambit claim of ecological democracy. And there are a whole bunch of institutional devices that can bring that into view in actually existing liberal democracy. The most parsimonious is the precautionary principle. That when there is evidence, um, you know, of serious or irreversible harm now in the future, here or there, then lack of full scientific evidence should not be a reason for not taking anticipated reaction. And that is a proxy simple mechanism for thinking about the future, other countries, non-human species, ecological communities. But all of this requires a prior environmental philosophical defense of why we should consider non-human others, which we, I don't have time for now. But if you accept that, 
then this is what an ecological democracy would look like. But you have other forms of representation, just as you have seats reserved in Parliament for Indigenous people, like in New Zealand, you might have some seats reserved for those uh, to represent the future or, or whatever you think deserves representation, or you can have a commission for the future or an environmental commission like you have in New Zealand that plays an advocacy role for those who aren't electorally enfranchised uh, or an environmental advocacy role or whatever. So there's lots of ways you can build institutions into what we have, not to force the hand of decision makers, but to bring these concerns in view, which are typically ignored. That would be my response. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robin. It, I think we're just running out of time, but we can try to make room for one more question. I want to recognize, me gustaría invitar a Jonathan Barton. Tal vez ustedes pueden intentar. You can try to go. Thanks, uh, Alexandra. Uh, I was, uh, many, many thanks for the presentation. I, I was struck how, how when you were talking, I was thinking about the 70s and 80s and um, uh, CND, the campaign for nuclear disarmament, and uh, the threat of mutually assured destruction. So I don't know where really that, fit, whether that's chronic or, uh, they certainly weren't moving towards a state of exception, but I, it strikes me there are a lot of similarities between the two movements in, in terms of this catastrophic end game. And also really the, the issue about civil disobedience and, and different forms of civil disobedience. And I think that's where Extinction Rebellion and the things they, they did in London last year, perhaps, or the year before, um, were phenomenally powerful in terms of you know putting a yacht on on outside Parliament and stuff. So it strikes me is that it's about civil disobedience, and there's a lot of commonalities between the women at Greenham Common and and, and other types of of activism. But my, my my question really it goes. I'd like to go back to what your MP said and was writing about about uh, neoliberalism and and how how fossil fuel. Uh, financing really dominates contemporary liberal democracy, whether that's in Australia or the States or, or wherever. You know, it, it's the dominant form of, 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 of income, uh, of, of wealth generation that in the last century. So uh, it's, and I see that, you know, this is 10 years after the 2008 crisis. And, and these, these two uh, different themes have been elided in a sense. Well, Greta's out there talking about the change needed for the future. But a lot of the Extinction Rebellion and others are really alighting these things about the crisis of, of late capitalism. So I wonder whether how far are you agreeing with your MP and that sort of line of argument? And it's a crisis of liberal democracy when it's financed by fossil fuel capitalism. So whether whether it moves in that way and, and hence the defense of well, all that they're threatening democracy. No, they're threatening fossil fuel democracy and they want to create a a post fossil fuel democracy whereby we think about different types of financing and and um, well, well, yeah, in, in Latin America, we call it neostructuralism, the, the links between uh, capital mm -hmm. and the state. So I just you know, if you could tell me about how, how far you're going that, down that road. Thanks. Well, um, I mean, my own analysis and other work would would furiously agree with you. Australia is based on carboniferous capitalism. <laughs> And there is, we've got some version of the Dutch disease and the resource curse. There's a revolving door between the mining industry and both the Labour Party and the National Liberal Coalition. And they in fact call themselves the Greenhouse Mafia. We didn't label them that, the insiders. So an ex-Minister of Resources will then move to become a lobbyist for the mining industry, whether from Labour at from both sides of the major party. So they have, the fossil industry has a double representation in the parliament, literally. And of course, the National Party doesn't look after farmers. It was used to be the country party. They're also looking after the mining industry. And so much so that we've got a group in Victoria. Victoria is more the left jurisdiction in the country, in case you hadn't noticed. There's um, Farmers for Climate Change who want to disaffiliate from the National Farmers Federation because it's not properly looking after climate change. So everything you say is real. And our local member, Adam Ban, Adam Ban is a well-known um, Marxist ecological Marxist. So he, that's certainly his reading. And he, um, uh, he's worried about the future of labor with um, you know, AI taking over everything. So he, you, know, you go to talks by him, he's a former academic PhD and from Monash University. So a lot of the people in the movement are, are university academics. They've just said, damn it, I'm gonna get involved. I'm not just gonna write about this anymore. So um, 
and if you read this little book, um, this is not a drill. The analysis is in there for sure. So um, this is definitely, these are definitely things that, you know, it's about, there's tons of extracts I could have pulled out of that saying exactly what you've said. So that's part of their analysis. They think the democracy is corrupted and not working properly. Um, that's why the Citizens' Assembly is the go-to, at least for XR. But we also, the Climate Restoration Project here is more scientists who are doing a bit of technocratic dreaming, I have to say. And one of them has developed a, a climate emergency bill that I found a little concerning. And when I compare that to what Adam Van actually introduced to the parliament, it was nothing like what they prepared. I know the guy, right, quite well. He's used to work inside government in Victoria. So um, it's a motley movement. So it's very, you have to be very careful generalizing, but the answer to your question is definitely that analysis is in the movement for sure.